Good morning or good evening. Good something. Anywhere on earth, right? Good day, eh? (laughs) (laughs) I have with me today on the Plone Podcast, Paul Everett, legend of Plone and Zope and, 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 and. And he's kindly agreed. Yeah, thanks for having me. This I've been looking forward to this conversation, not just all day, like all weekend. Ah, wow, must have been a pretty quiet weekend for you. <laughs> no, I mean, I appreciate you going into the museum and and taking me out on a field trip. The uh, those people in the card punch uh, booth are really mean to me, so I appreciate you getting me out, liberating oh. me for a little while. Oh my gosh, I feel like I'm the total amateur trying to interview the pro the guy who's been on so many shows done his own shows and talked to so many people it's I'll, it's I'll a new age best. that's one of the cool things is uh something i talk about in the talks is um old old heroes got to get out of the way and make room for the new heroes and in every talk that you give every talk that i give someone in the audience is the next person And she's going to hear it and she's going to go off and kick ass. And 20 years from now, she'll be passing the torch to the next person. So I think I've reached that age. In a couple of decades, you'll reach that age too. Oh, nice. Flattery will get you always. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Hopefully for everyone who's listening in, uh, the name Paul Everett is like on a pedestal, you know, because Paul set up uh i believe yep, you were yeah. the first plone foundation president oh yeah oh yeah that's right <laughs> like, like uh like this get get the memories going from the oh, uh, yeah. iceberg storage but yeah and and uh you were you were a leading light you were uh you were all over the place when i started using plone and um famous guy and i was going oh my gosh i get to talk to him and over the years you've been so nice to me and and, and i know to so many others in the plone community just helping get people going, working with Plone, uh, working then with, well, actually before that, working with Zope and then Plone and then Pyramid. And you've been at JetBrains for a number of years now and helping us get get great tools. So, I mean, I, I don't want to get in the way here. You've got some things that you've got, you've got stories and I just want to get you going. Like, tell me your origin story for being with Plone. First, when did we meet? I thought that we met at Web Lion. At, is that yeah. when we met in uh, Penn State? I think so. I'm thinking 2010, something like that. Um, because I took the training for Pyramid from either, I think it was Tres or it might have right. been Chris. Might have been Chris. It yeah. might have been Trace. I've got a f- effing funny story for everything. On the way back from that, we're driving Trace's car down i-85 or whatever that is through the alleghenies back to virginia and he and i are like talking and talking and talking i'm not paying attention to the fuel gauge we run out of gas and i swear to god it's a long way from anything but it's downhill we rolled for what felt like 15 minutes down an exit hard right another right to stop sign down a country road. And just when we were about to run out, we hit a gas station story of my life. You know, that sounds like a Nikola uh, truck commercial. Sounds like a software morality tale. (laughs) Ran out of juice on the way home. That's good. Good timing though. I mean, you were, you've been, well, okay. I was going to tie that in. You've been at the right place at the right time for, I have for been cool things like happening. Um, the first, uh, oh crap, that's good for me was I was a Navy officer in flight school in Pensacola and I had to cheat to get into flight school. I'm not the tallest person. <laughs> and um, that caught up with me and I had to go find something to do. And it turns out in Pensacola, Florida, there was a guy in 1991 whose job was the navy's in- internet the internet what's that mm. uh and so i got lucky enough in <laughs> i guess in late 92 the guy who ran ww or the guy who ran navy.mil dns sat in the booth beside me the cubicle beside me and i rolled back and i said hey can i have www.navy.mil and he's like what's that 
And uh, so that was that was a moment where I look back and I think, thank goodness I was not tall enough to fly. <laughs> wow. Uh, there's a whole story there, too, that I guess we'll, yeah. we can just kind of move on there. But but so so when you made that first website, can, what did you use to create it? Good point. Um I, uh, even then, this was before there was a CGI standard, but there was extensibility through Fork and people were using Bash and people were using C. I ain't using Bash, I ain't using C. Everybody was using Perl. So I go to the bookstore, got this totally vivid memory about this. I go over to the, so for everyone that's watching this, books are these things made of paper and they used to sell them in stores. <laughs> You'd have to go to the store to get them. I went over to the computer section and I found the Pearl book and I had this distinct memory of going, oh, hell no. <laughs> and you could download the Python tutorial in a uh, .ps format, print it. And I took the uh, tutorial in my 286 laptop and a DOS Python on vacation to France to meet for kind of the second time, my future wife and I taught myself in her living room. <laughs> Python, so embarrassing. So that was uh, the programming at that time was, um, this is 1993. In 93, when you want to get listed on the web, you actually emailed Tim Berners-Lee and he added you to the page. Wow. Yeah. Um, so in 93, uh, I've got a, the, the the earliest, farthest back thing of me on the internet is asking a compile question about CERN HTTPD, and Mark Andreessen answered it. And as I joke, our paths went in different directions after that. Clearly, we see who's been the most successful. I mean, look, yes, you're on the show here. Yes, he, he could buy you and me and sell us for parts. You know, he keeps asking me to be on the show, and I just I know. Keep, man. I know. You don't want to lower your standards. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Nice, 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 nice. Well, that's really impressive because I remember doing Pearl CGI because that was the thing that was out there, mm -hmm. and you were able to write – you were able to respond to all the requests with Python. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it was a simpler time, let's put it that way. Um, but uh, it was, I mean, it's just interesting how the direction everything goes. At the time, it was all uh, Gopher and Waze and these other things like that. And things come, things go. And what is it that makes something take off? Why did Python take off? Why did Python during its time outlast Pearl and Tickle and any other choices. And um, it's it's just interesting. None of us could have ever imagined what the web would be. And uh, it's been, it's been fun. I remember playing with Gopher and Archie and I can't mm -hmm. remember some of the Archie, other yeah. tools. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. And then um, my wife and I joke about, the, well, we chuckle because I think the first package I bought for a browser on a computer it was windows probably 95 or something mm. it was uh cello or yeah, I can't remember. wow that brings and we that tried idea. it and it was like man it renders pages like crap <laughs> and it's like ah screw it what's this mosaic thing what's this mosaic thing yeah tables wow <laughs> oh yes the marquees <laughs> yeah <laughs> the I give a a, a keynote Python 90, 1994 about the first um, meetup in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And in there, I've got a screenshot of Amazon running in Mosaic and what it looked like. It's hilarious. Did you keep that all those years? No, I mean, you can go to the Wayback. I, or, okay. It wasn't even Wayback Machine, just an image search for it. I was going to say, because that's quite the pack, right? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Did, so, and when before you learned how to program, obviously before you went to navy to the navy, mm -hmm. how did you mm -hmm. get into that? 
just as a kid, um, there was a program that uh, you got on a bus. We went over to another school. And one of the things that we did there was a Commodore Pat. Mm -hmm. Actually, no. The very first thing was a deck rider teletype thing where the university is 100 miles away. And here's a telephone with a modem that's a free call to the university. But if you call this phone that's right beside it, it's a long distance call. I'm like, how how can that be? They're like three feet apart. So that's but how just got into got into basic and some other things and didn't really do a ton of ton of programming, um, but did enough to find, as we all know, uh, there's just this mind palace. Mm -hmm. that you get from programming and you go into the mind palace and it's just so much fun i'm trying to think of the uh the the image i have is more of like a, a hole i keep digging myself into <laughs> <laughs> like it's a mine let's just put it that way yeah like so the uh, well that batman fell into as a kid right <laughs> did you did you get any formal education in programming uh, funny story number 5,000, um, uh, at the fine scholarly institution known as the University of Florida, which was Playboy's number one party school my freshman year, but I digress. I was computer engineering, and first, I wasn't a very committed student, let's be honest. Second, one semester, I didn't get the memo about don't take this class and this class together because all the tests are lined up. And I got, I did poorly and got removed from computer engineering. Bad enough that I couldn't actually get any other department on campus to pick me up. So I had to stay in engineering. Which engineering then? Materials engineering, specifically ceramics. So everyone jokes about pottery. I'm a pottery engineer. <laughs> nice. That's cool. I've never heard of a ceramics engineer, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah. there has to be somebody doing that. Nearly every uh, engineering discipline is limited by materials. I'm, I was thinking that, well, I... I did engineering myself. It wasn't computer science. It was systems systems design engineering, which was like a, uh, it was created in the 60s at University of Waterloo. And I think it was a ah. hallucinatory mishmash of math that was made to sound good. Um, and in the end, it was, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. And mm. then if you were lucky, you specialized in something. And so it ended up being software for me. But Right. I've thought of so many people who've not had a formal education in computers and yet ended up just getting sucked in. Indeed. Uh, for you, um, do you find that the systems engineering background, even if you know 99.9% .9 of the details didn't go anywhere for you, just that mindset and the way to think about things was beneficial? I, I think it has been because we were more generalists than yeah. anything else. And it, it has helped me in some ways just be able to move from different technologies to other technologies, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm never going to be as detail oriented as some of the great software developers I've met. Um, but so it, in a way it has helped, but you know, not the same as uh, somebody who'd been deeply into software engineering or in computer science. Mm -hmm. That's okay because it takes all types, I think, all sorts yeah, of knowledge and approaches. So, so Paul, when you were, so you were at the Navy for a while mm -hmm. and then, and then, okay, so now I'm trying to think you were, you were then involved. How did you get involved with Zoop? Like what was the origin for your being in Zoop? I, I realize that this is the segment that will get ravenous attention from tens of people. <laughs> so I'll try to breeze through this pretty quickly. Uh, my college roommate and I started a company. Uh, we moved to Virginia. Uh, he was a Marine. I was Navy. He was Lotus Notes. I was Internet. And we decided to support both and see which one wins. Um. 
And then uh, once I got kind of involved with the Python community and had a Python company, we were making software for the Navy. I did the, I did that gross thing where you have a job in the government and then the next day you have a contracting job with the government for your old job. So we um, helped run uh, www.navy.mil. Great friend of mine who got me started in everything on this, Jim Glenn, was good gosh, you know, you think of these little Jenga pieces in history It actually led letter, le later to the Python Labs team and all of those guys. Uh, so we made software for them to run their sites. And then we uh, hooked up with a consortium of newspapers, Gannett, Knight, Ritter, and Landmark to make classified ad software in Python. Uh, they were the majority owner, 70-30. Lesson to all of you budding entrepreneurs out there. If there's going to be a 70% owner, make sure it's you. Because mm. one day they raised their hands and they said, we dissolve this company. We keep all the customers. You keep that open source software that we don't care about. So that open source software got published later as something called Bobo for object oh. publishing. Um, we wrote a W3C tech report about it. Jim Fulton joined us at the time. Jim Fulton was, if Guido got hit by a bus, I believe most people would say he was most likely to, to, to steer Python. Um, then we got, uh, VC money. We had a commercial offering on top of Bobo and became the thing that's known as Zope. Wow. I I have I remember the name Bobo, but I don't recall the story behind it. So yeah, and it, okay, there ahead. is a story behind it. It was supposed to be released at IPC nine, I think, or something like that. IPC eight, two days before. I didn't have a name for the software. Honest to God, most of my stories are bullshit. This one's true. I'm like, what's the stupidest name I could think of? And we'll have to come back and rename it. And immediately Bobo popped into my mind. You remember Chrissy Wainwright? She um, mm -hmm. posted uh, something in a, in a Slack channel about uh, how the most permanent solutions are the temporary ones you put in. <laughs> <laughs> Chrissy, you are completely right about that. <laughs> And Chrissy, you've probably executed that maneuver more than a few times. Oh my gosh, she's going to contact me to edit here. <laughs> <laughs> no, Chrissy, you're spam. I'll say Chrissy's name like 20 more times so it can't be edited out. The company's name, wasn't it Digital Creations? Uh, another funny story. <laughs> this is going to be the funny story story. I love it. Um, so I guess this would be after the second round of investment. Uh, the name of our company when we were with the newspapers was Digital Creations. And it, every time the investors changed, we had like Digital Creations 2 LLC. And, you know, we should have used calendar versioning maybe instead of semantic versioning. And, um, <laughs> so this, we're talking like, 98 was when we open sourced Zope. So we're probably talking 99. And this was when Red Hat did their IPO and Netscape and all these other kind of open source got super freaking popular. Uh, Eric Raymond had Cathedral in the Bazaar. And we actually, he's got a chapter on us in there. Um, give away the recipe, open a restaurant. Hopefully he doesn't update that book. That story didn't end well. And I got invited to give open source business model talks at VC conferences. And I had this um, presentation, Funding the Perfect Beast, kind of a play on a Don Henley song. I don't know why that popped into my head. And I had a slide, The Perfect Distance, that the open source package and the open source company had to be a perfect distance apart. If they were too far apart, people wouldn't adopt it because they wouldn't think it was a safe bet. But if they were too close, no one would contribute because it just feels like a shill to give money to blah, blah. And I said on that slide, the one thing you should never, ever, 
ever do is name the company the same as the software. Uh -huh. So we get our C round, 12 and a half million. A grown-up CEO comes in. One of the first things we do, what do you think? <laughs> Zope Corporation. Zope Corporation. Where did that idea of yours come from? The, the one about having a distance between the company and the software? Um, I, I guess at the time, there were some things going on. Like with our, uh, our big competitor at the time was uh, Ars Digita. Uh, ACS. Um, and I think they wanted to show how fast someone could burn through $44 million. Um, they did a quality job on that. <laughs> um, but I was trying to think about what we were trying to do with building a huge ecosystem that tons of small companies all over the world, small consulting companies could put their DNA into. And I thought of it kind of like, there's a cow, you know, and um, you got to feed the cow. And maybe we made, you know, maybe we bought the cow, but then the feeding of the cow was like all of us were feeding the cow. And then we all get our share of the milk. But then we, you know, we step up and we're like, we gave you this damn cow. We're taking the milk. And everyone stops mm -hmm. feeding the cow and there's no milk. And so um, in this story, Zope was the cow. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> and uh, it just felt like if we wanted to send the signal that we're all in this together, we can't be the ones to milk the cow. I'm just thinking about how it is that you had been able, you, you were still pretty young then, no, back then. Um, no, that was deadpan. Um, but you were still able to reflect on something like that. That's pretty deep. Uh, a product of mistakes. Hmm. Um, I remember reading the book, Crossing the Chasm. I think I read it three, it's a thin book. It's kind of the Bible of high-tech product management. And I read it three times in one weekend because it had every mistake we had made. And I thought, why didn't I read you like two years ago? Um, but being like really in open source for at that point, probably five years because of Python, um, you got a real feeling for the value proposition. And if you're trying to make a platform rather than a product, that's another mistake. Uh, you got to know the difference between a product and a platform. Mm -hmm. If Calvin was here, if Alvin and, and if uh, Alan and Lemmy were here, they would be laughing right now because I gave a talk at the first Plone conference about, I think the title was something like Plone, product or platform, question mark, subtitle, you're wrong. <laughs> and I wanted to yell at the Plone community because they couldn't decide if they were a product or a platform. But if you're a platform, you got to know where to leave space for other people to add value on top of it. And if you want to capture 100% of the value, you're not a platform anymore. And you mm -hmm. see this a lot going on today with these megacorps that want to own everything end to end. Man, very impressive. So after you set up so Corporation, um, Tell me a little bit about what happened at Zope. Uh, what a fun time. So uh, Jim Fulton joined us when we were Digital Creations um, as CTO. Um, we had some software at that time pre-Bobo. How much of the story can I tell? Uh, I'd, I'd love great. to hear it all. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Give me the good um, parts. Uh, he joined us. God, they, you know, I crack myself up on some of these stories. I can tell. <laughs> um, we had a Python object publisher at that time before Jim. Uh, and there's a W3C tech report on it. And um, it translated URLs to Python requests. And it ran a long running process using ILU, which was a Corba software from Xerox Park, 
embedded as an extension to HTTPD. And so we didn't have the CGI startup time, blah, 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 blah. Um, Jim joined us and I committed to giving a talk on this at the Python conference three or something like that. Let me do the math here. Yeah, IPC three, spam three that Jim was hosting in California, Lawrence Livermore, I guess he was co-host or something, or maybe Paul was, uh, anyway. Um, and I wanted to go to France with my wife for vacation. I was like, Jim, you're giving this talk. And he's like, I don't know what the web is. I've never done the web. So he gets on the plane. He's got a three hour tutorial to give. <laughs> so he gets on a plane goes and delivers the tutorial on my crappy soft or our crappy software. On the flight back, he writes Bobo. Object public. He in, kind of invents the formal idea of object publishing. This was way before REST. And from that, we started to add some other pieces. And this was all in, in service of this. Hey, can I tell a funny story? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're we're making money off the Navy at this point, mostly uh, the Navy and the newspapers. And we have, God, I wish I had it in my hand. We sold the Navy a $20,000 package, an application server that was written in Python and it fit on a floppy. $20,000. And this includes the Python interpreter. We're like, eh, that doesn't feel like $20,000. Let's put it on a CD. But then it'll be a CD with 639 <laughs> megabytes empty. And so we put all the doc. And then I tell this story. I don't remember. This might not be true, but it sounds true and it's funny. So I'll say it anyway. Zip. If you do like zip plus nine, it will really or minus nine, it'll really compress. But if you do plus nine, it'll inflate. And if you just run it enough times, it feels like $20,000. Uh, so we had this software and this is the original killer idea and cardinal sin of everything that we were about. How we effed things up. We were handing this over to people who didn't want to know Python. And this is like 97. Python was not killing it in 97. So we wanted to hide Python and we had a server and you would connect to it with a web browser and you would actually program through the web. We would store Python in a database. What database? An transactional object database written in Python. I have a memory of Jim coming into my office frustrated. like, what do you think we are, a database company? And then he goes on to do ZODB and just kills it. Um, and this whole system had a brochure, three things. Let's see if I can remember it. Um, URLs you can read to your grandma over the phone. We were competing with Vignette at the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, CNET was using Vignette and they had these URLs that were like blah, 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 question mark vomit for 50 characters and a database that feels like a file system and because it's a hierarchical database and the third thing was um uh don't let your customer shoot you in the foot so a security model of permissions and ACLs that was hierarchical and you could turn over control of a part of a website we could turn over to the consortium. They could turn over the newspaper. The newspaper could turn it over to the classified ad person at a customer site. Uh, so that's where that all came from. At some point when we got ownership of the software, got investment, we're like, we're going to make a product and sell it. And thus was born the thing known as Zoe. Wow. And at that time, how many people were working with you at Zoop? When we got the, you know, when I, I'll say when we got the second round of funding, uh, O'Reilly was in the second round. That was cool. Um, we were probably like 15 people. Uh, hmm. When we got the third round, um, we, we signed a letter of intent, waited a while in the dot-com bur bubble burst. They really shouldn't have followed. They should have stabbed us in the back and walked away. 
but they gave us the money. Uh, and we got up to 50 people. We, uh, the Python Labs team, Guido, Barry, Tim, Fred, um, Jeremy, uh, we're doing be open and that fell through. And so we hired them and they were with us for a few years. Um, something I'm actually kind of proud of that. That was a dangerous point for Python, the dot-com bubble burst, and then kind of felt like they might go in different directions. So we got it to around 50 people, but the writing was already on the wall at that time. There wasn't going to be a big market. Man, I had no idea how, how big you guys were. That's, It was, um, would it have ever worked? I don't know. That's an interesting question. If, if the economy would have stayed super hot, we had boston.com. We had the number one uh, sta uh, CBS station in New York was on Zope on 9-11. And I believe it was the mm -hmm. only site that didn't crash. Chris wow. McDonough had like four telnet sessions in the background trying to keep everything up. Um, so it was, a, it was an interesting story. So many interesting people there uh, at that time. So many interesting ideas that came out of that. Shane Hathaway, I, either Shane or Trace invented the phrase monkey patch. Hmm. We invented the idea of sprints. Not agile sprints, but showing up at a place and doing a sprint. Um, so that, that was a, a fun and interesting time. Wildly innovative software remains John Udell did the keynote at the first Zope track at the Python conference. And he said that it was Python's killer app and the only innovative non-copying thing that open source had done to that point. Ooh. Yeah. It was pretty wild. It, 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 it felt like small talk meets Lotus notes. And then Django came. <laughs> At the same time, we were making a big mistake with the Zope 3 migration. Now, along those lines, interplone. So that can be the next segment of the chat. <laughs> I love how you're running this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, you but please you me should. the outline. I'm just following. No, no, you. no. I, I love it. Well, I mean, we know, well, uh, you and I know that. Plone is the biggest consumer of Zope, Zope 2 anyway, mm -hmm. right? Um, but for a while, I was seeing about a lot of people who were in Plone, uh, like big, big names. You know, I remember while well, Steve McMahon was doing a whole bunch of stuff with Zope mm -hmm. before Plone came along. And there were um, at a previous couple of previous jobs, I was bunches of applications were running in Zope, still running in Zope. I mean, things that were like... Uh, like, right. I mean, it just venerable applications mm -hmm. still running. So when you were writing Zope 3 and there was this big, the component architecture, mm -hmm. I remember that was a bit controversial for people, maybe mm -hmm. for people who maybe weren't as, as deep thinkers as, as some of you were, it was maybe a bit of a challenge, but oh, sure. Plone can, so, but Plone continued to use Zope. And so that's been kind of, I guess, Zope's continuing success story. <laughs> it's the Plone runtime. Maybe Yin's Vagalpole out there is screaming at me right now. I'm not using Plone. <laughs> <laughs> so at what point did you start moving away from doing just Zope <laughs> and, and you started becoming involved doing Plone? Uh, I can tell you almost to the day, <laughs> July 2002-ish. Uh, so I've been a, involved a little bit up to that point. You know, the CMS market, content management system, was a big, big thing then. And it felt like during the course of this interview, someone wrote a new CMS and published it in some programming language. So many CMS systems, PHP especially. And um, Python wasn't quite there yet. This was way before Django happened. Uh, and so we were writing basically custom CMSs as a company for consulting gigs over and over and over. And then we would try to keep some of the intellectual property and try and reuse it and stuff like that. But if you take venture capital money, you know what doesn't have a good multiplier? Consulting. 
So if the investors want to get liquid and exit, you need a product that you sell. Um, so we were kind of steering in that direction. We had a product we sold, Zeo, Z-E-O, which was a multi-process version of the database. Um, and then a replicated version of that. And somewhere around, we'll say, yeah, okay, I know exactly when. The morning of 9-11, before everything went down, the status changed for Rob and me at Zoe Corporation. And a year later, I left and went to Europe and was doing trying to do a nonprofit business network in Europe. But that was really the change where I got into Plone. Uh, in, in that time period was the first EuroPython in Charleroi, Belgium. And we had a layer on top of Zoke called the CMF, Content Management Framework, itself a funny story. It was the successor to the portal, the ill-fated portal toolkit. And we hired Trey Seaver. And on his first day on the job, he took over the portal toolkit and created the CMF, Content Management Framework. Um, so the CMF and thus Plone have a lot of Trace-isms in it. And you've met Trace. and. My man is opinionated <laughs> and he's usually right. So uh, in that time period, Alan and Alex started talking over IRC, creating a skin for the CMF because developers were terrible at design. Lamy brought in the design side. Alan brought in the machinery side and they made a skin for the CMF. It outgrew the skin and became the muscle and then the skeleton and the organs and all that other stuff. And at EuroPython 1, they met for the first time and rolled out Plone 1.0 wow. in, in a talk. They're like, we just met and here's Plone. Really cool moment. Really cool. In Belgium. In Belgium, yeah. Uh, so when I, when I was in Europe, I got much more into the Plone community it just felt like the things I had been talking about, about the cow and the milk and all that other stuff. And it's something that I think I wrote down to talk with you about. Um, uh, venture capitalism and open source is an interesting combination. And some of these open source things that have had the intellectual property owned by a foundation, PSF, hmm. DSF, Plone Foundation outlive their founders. They keep the level, the playing field level, and they are sustainable. You think, well, they're not sustainable because where's the money coming from? But they're culturally sustainable. Would you agree with that? I, I would definitely agree on the part about where's the money. Yeah. <laughs> but no, you're right. Um, because there isn't this 800 pound gorilla in the room. Mm -hmm. Everyone looks to everyone else and makes a, a group decision as opposed to just like sitting back and waiting for the big guy or the big company to, to make the moves. Yeah, right. Well said. So decision making is dispersed and more agile, I guess, is your point. My point was more on the commercial side. It leaves room for people to add value and make money. So it's a platform. And what happens is. Uh, these corporations, they want to capture all the value. At some point, they're like, yeah, we want to eat your cake too. It's the milkshake. I drink your milkshake. And um, the Plone community really felt like that, but it needed a holder of intellectual property. And so we had to get, we had to go through a lot of work for that. <laughs> I forgot. Computer associates. Yes. Was this around your time or not? I remember the announcement about the All foundation right. being formed and Computer Associates uh, donating a big chunk of dough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Computer Associates wanted to make a product based on Plum. But they didn't have anyone they could talk to to negotiate the rights to do it. So they coughed up 100K to create a foundation that would own the rights and then sign a deal with them. We had to go around and get all of the authors 
to agree to the new IP regime and sign a contributor agreement. So we had to invent a contributor agreement. Um, we had to have a board election. Actually, I had to have a bootstrap board that would then create the first board. All of those things, uh, super fun time. Everybody was really cool about it. A couple of people asked some hard questions, but they deserve to be asked. Uh, and there, I don't think there's been that much of a problem since then. Plone had to go through the work of hiring an agency to get trademarks in all the relevant jurisdictions. Kind of grown up stuff. And you were doing all this while you were working for, can I say it? When you're in Europe? Yeah, uh, Zope Europe Association. Um, yeah, um, it was, uh, as it turned out, I got a small stipend at that time as director and devoted, I don't know, maybe half of my time to all that kind of work and stuff. But uh, there started to be Plone conferences. Alex, I think, no, Alan organized the first Plone conference in New Orleans, I guess, like maybe yeah. 2003 or something? Uh, that sounds right. Boy, that's And then sad. they just started oh, taking off. There was the, the infamous the... castle sprint at the castle gold dig in uh, Austria. Same guys, Phil, Robert and Phil organized the Plone Conference in Vienna in the building that Mozart assembled his murals for the Magic Flute or something like that. What a wild, it's just so many interesting stories that all of us in the community, all of us in the community have been blessed to have over the years. I'll go ahead. Can I show the props? Love it. All right, yep. cool. Please, please. So the first book on Zope was in book. French. Remember what a book is, people. Yeah, this is a book. It's got pages. Look at that. Wow, that looks pretty heavy. It's pretty big. <laughs> yep, yep. By uh, the Ingeni Web guys in uh, oh, Paris. Yeah. And um, the first book, I think this is the first book on Plone. I'm, I'm asserting that it's in video. So now I guess it's true. <laughs> is in Japanese. No. Yeah, wow. Well, wait, shouldn't it be going from right to left? That's a good question. Not my department. Ha! Fake prop. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote that? I should know. I met them in Japan. I apologize. I don't remember. Hmm. We'll have to dig. Yeah. That's cool. So that so was... It was a fun time. Plone got um, a lot of recognition as kind of the number one open source enterprise -y kind of CMS. Uh, InfoWorld loved Plone at that time, kept giving them awards every year for best open source package. A um, lot of companies everywhere that kind of bet their business, small, like 10 person companies that had a chance to grow and hire and create new things and host cool events and really just the glory years for that. So they were, these companies were building, well, they were using a CMS mm -hmm. or was Plone still considered a platform at the time? <laughs> hmm. So it's an interesting point. Was Plone a product or a platform? If it's a product, there's not a lot of consulting to do because it's ready to go out of the box, right? But if it's a platform, your programmers can do cool new things to make it talk to uh, CRM like Salesforce, uh, like many of the famous people, uh, John and David and all of them did in the beginning. And where is that balance? Do you have an opinion on this? Oh my gosh. I know we've, I, I feel like Plone was able to focus its message and say we're CMS. Although product or platform? Product. Which uh, means it's less exciting for developers, right? Developers yeah. looking at it going, eh, there's nothing in here for me. That's a good point because the decisions you make in the development of the software, you got to know where does the buck stop? Is it with the users or the developers? Are you trying to create a good user experience or a good developer experience? And to a degree, that's where Zoop might have gone a little awry in the Zoop 3 transition. We were focused on machinery and um, took our eye off the ball a little bit. But 
the way I settled into this for Plone is maybe this is right. Ra- Feel free to tell me, Paul, you're just rationalizing. It's a pluggable application. It comes out of the box ready to be useful. And you could do things and just deploy it without writing a line of Python. You could plug in add-ons written by other people, wire them up with configuration. You're still not writing Python. Or you could make a product and ship it to a package and ship it to other people. That seems fair. (laughs) No, that's good. There's flexibility there. There's flexibility there and there's still value. Uh, it's funny. I, I think the the prime directive for the origin of Plone would be f- interesting if Alan Runyon, uh, co-founder, uh, would still say this, was uh, Python developers suck at pretty UI. <laughs> and Plone was just going to do that work for you. <laughs> and you... So, you really got something of value out of the box if you used Plum. It was doing something you should never be allowed to do. (laughs) I'm definitely part of that group. (laughs) I know we have people like Chrissy taking care of us, right? Yes. Yeah. That, that was definitely one of the reasons why I felt comfortable selecting Plum at the university here in, in Oshkosh. Because I was looking at it and going, my gosh, it does all this stuff and it Mm -hmm. looks good. I can just show it to people and not be embarrassed. (laughs) And other people are doing the work. And now here we are like 50 decades later, you're doing the work. (laughs) (laughs) So when you, when you started working more with Plone, oh, and actually let's, let's, let's not move too far ahead. Tell me more about the Soap Europe Association. Mm-hmm. Not that much to tell. Uh, I had four years in France. Wonderful time. Kids got to grow up there. Um, it just wasn't financially sustainable. Um, and uh, we had a good number of companies that were putting in money for me to help bid on projects to get multiple companies together to bid on something that was too big for them. I mean, if it's a 500 K deal and your last year's turnover was 200 K, you're not going to win that deal. But if you can assemble a series of companies, uh, especially if they're across countries, because in Europe at that time, that was a cool thing to do. Uh, Then you had a chance to win the deal and then to actually execute it because there was a bigger labor pool if there were people grouping together. Um, We did quite enough. We did some EU grant kind of things. The biggest thing we did was Oxfam and the CMS for Oxfam uh, administered that contract most of my time in Europe. And my gosh. If you can, if you want to be on the right side of the angels, Oxfam is on the right side of the angels. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're legit. So that's mostly what we did with the partner network was trying to bid on things and grow each other's companies and then try and take the IP and put it back into the platform to kind of lift up all the boats. Yeah. Because when I when I started becoming more aware of the community and the the, the set of clone providers, um, Blue Dynamics Alliance is mm-hmm. the one that I realized. Oh, this is what they're doing. They're trying to band together and bid on bigger contracts. And I thought that was brilliant. Well, I mean, I guess they had a model to follow. Uh, actually, Robert and Phil were probably the keys to helping. They're the Blue Dynamics guys. Were the key to me getting it off the ground. Uh, They were the first people involved. They twisted other people's arms to get involved. And um, they also played a big role in getting Plone from toddler stage economically to sustainable. That's pretty impressive that you're able to do that um, and and still maintain 
well the 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 idealism i feel like uh, we're all like i think people in the plum community are idealists um mm-hmm. especially because of the way that you describe having that distance between the company and the product sure. and turning the ip back over to the community that's that seems rare to me that people want to do that like to find that balance between making a living and still plowing it back into what other people can benefit from Indeed. And uh, in this case, we actually have an existence proof. Um, at the time, Zope Corporation was uh, selling their own CMS, Zope CMS, and um, had a lot of great ideas behind it, but it didn't have the big footprint of maybe 100 countries in every continent, including Antarctica on top of the platform that Plone had. I mean, Plone had Antarctica on top of the platform. Uh, And so just from a competitive perspective, one of them is still around. (laughs) (laughs) That's very cool, yeah. So then you started working more with Plone and (laughs) this is probably around the time when I started to get to know, well, hear about you more. Um, And you, you and Trace and Chris formed Agendalus. Right. Agendalus Consulting. And the project that I knew you for, which is around the time when I met you at Penn State, was the Open Societies Institute's Correct. intranet. And, and I don't remember, well, okay, so go ahead, go ahead. Uh, no, finish your thoughts, sorry. Well, I, mean, um, I remember, I think it was, it was that year, it was you know, 2010 and, uh, you gave a talk, I think it was called throwing out the baby with the bathwater, by the mm. way, you have awesome talks and you have great titles for your talks. So it's just, <laughs> so it's like, no, con- no valuable <laughs> content, but they're funny. As <laughs> Catchy, <laughs> but you had, you had been, I think, uh, so I understand it. you've been, you created this internet. It was massively successful and it was used by people in I don't know how many countries around the world. Um, and you had to rewrite it a second. You had to rewrite it to address some performance issues because, and this is the point you were making, which is Plone was more of a CMS and you were trying to build an application out of it. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then you came around with a second rewrite. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Right. So the, you have, to, you have that all right. I don't, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, I got really lucky because um, due to situation with my dad, uh, we were going to move back to the U.S. early. And Alan picked me up and, and w- let me uh, project manage uh, the Open Society project, the OSI project. Um, plus I was on the East coast, so I could take the train up and consulting on it. So I went from Oxfam coolest people in the world to OSI coolest people in the world with OSI. I'd be in meetings and the, the two people that I worked with the most also ran the website and were pretty high up on communication and they get a message. They look at each other and they walk out and two of their grantees got nabbed in Iran. You know, that just that that kind of thing would just happen over and over and over. They were OSI was always the engine behind the good guys. Uh, So that was very fulfilling to work on that. Um, Part of the way through all of this, some infrastructure changes at OSI. They wanted to move stuff from hosting inside the building to Linux based in the cloud. And with Alan's uh, project, we're tying it very much to his commercial offering with Windows and IS. And so it had to go through this kind of change. And we wanted to keep a lot of it, but like you say, change it to an application. And thus was born, Chris McDonough was on the project at the time. Trace and Chris were at Zoe Corporation. And both of them were already pretty famous. Uh, by the end of the Zoke Corporation run. And so the three of us formed Agendalus and Chris didn't go to 
computer science school at university. Totally no self-taught. No way. <laughs> uh, and just prodigious on what he's produced. If you if you think about Docker and what came before that, like Doc, what was it, Doc Cloud or something like that? What was Docker called before that? But for years and years and years, everything in Docker was run by something called Supervisor. Oh, uh, yeah. Chris McDonough. Mm -hmm. um, Yelp. Software like that. Reddit wound up being some of his software. And uh, he didn't get didn't get the billion dollar exit that he deserved for all the value he created all over the world. Uh, but that's a different story about open source and financing. Three of us got involved, took over the project, transitioned it to something called BFG on the way to something called Pyramid. So BFG was, yes, named after that BFG. And uh, if you'd like, Chris has about 20 Repose BFG books still in the closet in the office. Uh, we all live in the same town in Virginia. So we had an office, worked on this project. Then Chris had this great framework, but not a lot of adoption. Pylons had a whole bunch of adoption and Ben Banger wanted to get out of the framework ownership business. So we all met in Vegas in the <laughs> Luxor, which is shaped like a pyramid. I love it. That's my favorite. <laughs> wow. There you go. And thus was born Pyramid, which I still think is easily the best web framework in Python. Mm. The things it, it's a framework framework. The things it contemplates are like, it took all the lessons from Zope, all the mistakes, all the great ideas, made them a lot more Pythonic. Python friendly, modern. And um, it's, it's people, they don't even know what they don't know when it comes to pyramid. Oh my gosh, fantastic. The one bit that really stuck with me at the pyramid training that I took at Penn State was um, that the, the framework would do everything that was advertised. And it was 100% test coverage. I remember that yep, was a big yep. thing. You write the test before you write the code. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I remember it might have been Trace, it might have been Chris. I can't remember which which year it was. Um, said that if if your application, if your pyramid application runs slowly, it's probably because of something you added. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it was right because uh, I was telling my wife this that just the other day that uh, Plone at the time running on my first generation MacBook Air. Uh, would get like 10 requests per second. You know, mm -hmm. on this here. And Pyramid, we wrote this simple wiki thing. And oh my gosh, it got 600 requests <laughs> per second. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I said Pyramid replaced the sins of the past, Plone still had to sit on those sins. Yeah. <laughs> we knew where the bodies were buried because we buried them. So that was that was the time for the launch of Pyramid and the consulting work that we did in OSI, working with Allen and Infold Systems. Um, another really fun time. That did get to be pretty big. There was almost a chance that that software, there were a couple of other non, big nonprofits that adopted it, but there was a chance that it could have gotten a little bit bigger, but that never came to pass. Um Pyramid, like you said, 100% test coverage. Actually, documentation too. Chris hmm. released the documentation before he released the software. Wow. That's Chris McDonough. That's and cool. part of the reason for the performance is he had to get yelled at by Trace Siever in the office all the time. And again, Trace is usually right. You were then, you were a, a gentleist then for how many years? We'll say 2006 to 2015. And then as we were talking just before we started the recording, the the consulting business and sort of the, the revolving door of projects kind of got at some point got to be less interesting because that's, that's what it was for me. That's why. Indeed. Uh, do you want to talk about your experience first or you want me to go? Um, well, I, you know, this is really about you, but I'll just say briefly that, 
that being in consulting was always exciting because you would get to meet new clients and you'd listen to their requirements and translate those requirements into specifications or ideas, architectures. And then usually you get to build at least the start of a project uh, and hand it off to someone. But that was also the downside because you would get this project in the door and it would go out the door and then another one in the door mm -hmm. and out the door. And it became less, less fun to just see things go by. It became more fun to be part of something that lasted longer. Yeah, and you you got to be at this human sized company in Indiana with Gabrielle and Calvin and relationships with all kinds of people in the community, and it's just a fun, great gig being feeling like you're uh, the good guys, and a lot of the clients you had were the good guys too, right? Yes. Um, but you reached the same point I did. Uh, I very conscientiously uh, felt in 2015, I hadn't had a boss since I was in the Navy. Mm. I'm not going to count that nine month period where we had a professional CEO and um, he never left the office. Mm. Um, and before that, Rob Page and I, uh, co-founder, he and I both wore all the hats all the time. So uh, I really wanted a boss who was smarter than me. I also wanted just exactly like you, I wanted to work on a product over time and feel like I was part of something that was moving forward and like I'm putting my DNA into it and I can believe in it instead of pay me enough money and I'll believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I got really lucky to stumble across JetBrains and PyCharm at that time. It's like if it would have been six months earlier, it would have never happened. I was a, a customer, a paying customer of PyCharm at the time. I had talked about it publicly a lot. Um, and so it's a, a great gig at, an, at a great time, a privately held company. Mm. Believe it or not, they're, they're, you can have a company that doesn't go IPO. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's possible. I wanted to blame you publicly for getting me hooked on PyCharm because for, well, let's see, I'd say for 30 years, I'd been an Emacs user. Mm, that's what I switched yes. from too. Ah, uh -huh. yes. And uh, I'll be interested to hear what was the tipping point for you? Uh, you know, when Joel Burton came to the campus here at Oshkosh to give us some training in 2007, uh, just basically a plum development training. And he happened to be showing wing IDE mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he talked about it and and it sounded like, Oh, this is cool. This, this is more promising than, than the way that Emacs tries to find symbols and you try to jump around to look for definitions or classes versus variables versus something else. And, uh, but the promise of wing IDE never was fulfilled for me. I could, I got it to work once mm -hmm. to find the, what I was looking for. And it didn't work. So I gave up on it, went back to Emacs. And then uh, at the Barcelona Plone Conference 2017, you guys were giving out free licenses uh, for PyCharm uh, for random draw, <laughs> which I ended up getting. Uh, I mean, really, this is totally legit. I did not have my finger on the The scale. count of the vote doesn't matter as much as who counts the vote. <laughs> So I ended up trying it and I go, ah, I'm never going to like this as much as I like Emacs. But then I got hooked and it was uh, the ability to just find definitions and implementations and types so quickly. That was lovely. Matches mine a lot. Uh, I, I was Emacs forever and ever. I was in that mode where every time I moved around, I copied the same Emacs RC file because I didn't understand it. And if I lost that, I would be screwed. Ken Mannheimer was the source of, in Barry, distributed the Emacs RC file for the entire Python community. They are the patient zero. I had a brief try with Komodo, so similar to you with Wing. Um, but the idea of embedding Python in 
Mozilla Zool hmm. <laughs> wasn't the best idea. David Asher gave a talk about merging three garbage collectors. <laughs> and um, so I, I got into PyCharm for very similar reasons to you. Uh, I actually, the tipping point for me was no amount of hell could make JavaScript indent correctly. No Emacs, Elif, nothing was ever going to work. Why were you developing so much in JavaScript at that point? I was doing a good bit of JavaScript in the ha, 2002 timeframe. I was, I'd gotten big in uh, CMSs and there was a, there was a, actually a nonprofit for all the open source CMSs. And I was on the board of that. Oscon. No, Oscom. Oscon was O'Reilly open source content management. And uh, I launched a project with them trying to write a unified front end tool in Mozilla Zool. That's how I met Calvin. RDF. Wow. That's how I met Calvin. Resource descriptor framework. Don't even. <laughs> it's like, what does RSS stand for? Go. <laughs> <laughs> so um the the path to the IDE for me was just an exhaustion. And oh wow. If I throw money at you, all this pain goes away. Take my money, please. <laughs> And it's not even that much money, let's just say. It's not even that much money. No, it's great. I did the math on it recently. And even for the business price, for the ad, the median programmer salary, it's like the first minute and 10 seconds of the day. <laughs> and if your company values you that little. <laughs> I know it's around. when penny, penny wise, right? Pound foolish. Yeah. It's definitely yeah, true. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. I mean, I was just coding stuff today in <laughs> Django. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so one of the things that, that we talked about that, that you wanted to touch on was JavaScript as the UI. Mm -hmm. So you have some concerns. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be my punching bag? Please, 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 please go so for what's it. So your, what, uh, what's your take on this? Uh I, I freely admit I'm a generalist, so mm -hmm. I can learn. I can I can be an okay developer, but I'm not the greatest. I'm not the fastest. Sure. Also, partially because I don't spend as much time in it as I think a good developer would. But um, in Plone, because anyone who's listening to this hopefully knows that Plone has a new front end, which is written in React. It's, mm -hmm. it's called Volto. So Plone mm -hmm. 6 is default UI. And, and I find it challenging to understand the code that's in there. And um, David Glick fixed a bug for me at the Plone Conference Sprint in ABAR just uh, last October. And um, I looked at his bug fix and I was like, I, 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 I know what he's trying to do, but I can't map that concept to that syntax. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it, it's, been, it's been very much a struggle. And um, I have a partner I work with on some Plone projects and I've let him take on all the Volta work. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting because uh, the itch it was scratching, I was fully on board back in the origin of the origin of Volta. And um, I just come to see things a little differently. So is it okay if I get on my soapbox a little bit? Go for it, man. All right. Oh, isn't this where somebody says, hey, Paul, stand up. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> You're such Can a you good natured me? guy. Can you see me? I, I can't believe how good natured you are. I remember people yelling that at you at the Plone Symposium East. Yeah, yeah. Look at him. I'm actually two meters tall, man. Come on. Um, so the idea here is you want to give a rich experience in the browser to your audience. And to do that, you think you need to write an app. And we've already crossed the first Rubicon. Is the difference between a site and an app. Over the years, uh, SPAs, single page applications, 
have nibbled away to take over sight. And people think like, go look at the Google search page and see if you can read anything on it. Mm -hmm. The HTML there is gone. It's just a big pile of state that gets hydrated by some JavaScript. So many things like that. When you get this balance correct between site and app, several things fall out of that. First, there's a performance thing. The entire, there's a, there's a counter reformation in the world of the web now. Very important people are coming it right out and saying React has poisoned everything. Mm. In fact, today I was reading Alex Russell has a long, cool thread. He's been banging this drum for a while. He was with Google Chrome. He's now with Microsoft Edge. Um, that we design these things for that iPhone that I'm pointed at right now. But there are phones coming on the market with the Qualcomm chip that shipped in 2014. And they suck at your app. They royally suck at your app. And just from a website performance perspective, there's almost nothing you can do to fix this. React and JavaScript on the critical rendering path and all that other stuff and all the things they're trying to do now with React Server components to fix it, it's just not going to work. Why did they do all this? Because they value developer experience over user experience. That's what I think. That's an opinion. But talking to, you know, just about everybody I talk to, they get all jacked up about imports and things like that. They don't spend much time talking about time to first bite and all that other stuff. It really, or accessibility. What's the accessibility story for React? How many people think about that? So from a website performance perspective, there's been this uh, surge back towards just HTML, just CSS, just the web platform. Uh, HTMX is a technology that really tries to move the meter between app and site more towards you can do more with the site before you fall off the edge and have to make an app. And there are things coming in the web platform like view transitions and the navigation API that will give us more of the features that made you want to do a spa in the first place. But there's another aspect to this that is strategic for the world of Python. Uh, now, maybe three, four years ago, um, Kenneth Russell McGee gave a keynote plaque swans at PyCon. And he talked about, hey, we're here. Python is like number one on TOB now. We have conquered the world. But what are these black swan events that could like kill, destroy everything? And one of the things he talked about was um, JavaScript everywhere. And then Lucas Longa gave a keynote at Pylandinium just after that uh, with similar topics. And so I started giving keynotes about this, uh, Black Swans and whatever, I can't remember the name of it. Python is outsourcing the UI to React. Python's like, we'll do the back end and we'll send you JSON and you do that, you know, fluffy stuff, but we're going to do the hard stuff. Decision makers like the fluffy stuff. They like the pixels. They value the pixels. And they're going to wake up one day and say, hey, that JavaScript thing that gives me the fluffy pixels, can it do that other part too? Why? Yes, it can. Mm -hmm. You mean I don't have to have two different teams? Nope. Let's put JavaScript on the server. Um, it's not an unrealistic thing to worry about, in my opinion. And therefore, Python's web story, full stack story, has languished, in my opinion, for a couple of decades. You look at what all the innovation in the front ends about component-driven development and TypeScript and props and all these other things, we still use the same templating systems from the early 2000s. 
Zoe Page templates, for example, mm -hmm. or Jinja 2, it all feels like PHP and PSP and JSP. Um, we don't have the tooling. Like, how are you going to run Black on your templates? Oh, no, Black doesn't work with your templates. How about MyPy? Can MyPy mm -hmm. look at your... No, your MyPy can't look at your templates. How about your tests? Well, we'll just do an integration test. Well, no, that's not exactly unit testing. Uh, so from a strategic perspective, I want the world of Python to tap into this counter revolution, take back the UI. HTML is awesome. HTML is the web. JavaScript is not the web. HTML and CSS, that's the web. Soapbox over. I remember hearing about HTMX and uh, the I was thinking also about KSS. Ah, yes, Balash. KSS, kinetic style sheets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was that was the rage, I think. Uh, oh, geez, I'm not forgetting. I'm forgetting the year. But yeah, that uh, was... He was on the OSI project with us. Sure, who was? Balash. Who oh, of course. Right. But you're right. Uh, ideas like that, that, I mean, we all remember uh, progressive enhancement. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to that. Do you think there's something in particular that, is there anybody who's working in that direction? Or this is, this is the reaction that you were talking about, that people are going back away from React and just building HTML and CSS. Is there anybody who's driving that particular thing? That, that... Uh, on the Python side or in general? On Python side. Nobody. I think you just put your up your hand. <laughs> uh, yes. For the last four years, my summer programming project, et cetera, has actually been Sphinx internals and trying to... Uh, I sometimes I call it Sphenix, sometimes I call it Resphinx, and kind of reimagining lots of things in Sphinx, including like a view layer and a templating layer and stuff like that, and using it as a vehicle for kind of component-driven templating and a different approach to templating. And as it turns out, I am um, tagging along with Jim Baker from Jython and Guido on a pep that they're doing for three, hopefully for 313. I actually should have done some stuff this weekend on it to bring tag strings, an idea somewhat known in JavaScript to Python to have hopefully spark some new thinking in templating. People are pretty happy with Jinja too. But I want to make the case that uh, there's a lot going on on the other side of the fence and a lot of cool things for um, for modern front ends. And maybe we could offer something competitive with that. I didn't know you were working on Sphinx. So this is your summer project in your idle yeah, time. Yeah, dude. I have, I have rewritten this four times. I've gotten all the way to the finish four times. It, invo it involves some things on the way to get there that I, 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 I want, I look at the way I develop in WebStorm with TypeScript and all that stuff. And I want that experience over here. And we, it, it's just close enough to tempt you. It's like, oh, we've got typing. Could we have components that are kind of type oriented? that have props that are passed in, that you can get red squiggles in your IDE when you don't pass the right things in. Yeah. So how many more rewrites are you figuring? <laughs> uh, thanks to the arrival of Jim Baker and to a degree Guido, uh, it's, in a, it's in a much different place now. Nice. Well, I, it's great to hear that you're still deep into the coding world. You 
haven't given up on it at all. I mean, it, actually, that's that's the thing I was going to say about your current gig, which is you. Every time I've seen you give a talk or a training, I can't imagine the amount of time it took you to prepare the material that you present. And that to me is, yeah, I mean, it seems like it's a, I'm lazy, I guess. <laughs> it seems like a lot of work. And it's like, you're, you're back on that same treadmill. I feel of the, you know, have to prepare some new thing and then show it and then prepare another new mm-hmm. thing, and show it. Certainly developer advocacy, um, at Je- especially at JetBrains, dude, I work at a great company. So many tools. Not just that. It's it is a, just a human sized company. It's big now, <laughs> but it's still a human sized company that's in doing the right things for the right reasons. Uh, and um, I often joke that I should pay them not they should pay me but don't tell them i said that (laughs) but you're exactly right it's the kind of thing where every day it's like go learn this and talk about it and the cardinal rule in advocacy is don't be a pundit don't fake it talk about things that you actually know and that's that's a challenge when you have both python and the web world of javascript changes pretty fast i gave up i just i can't give up Paul, I I really want to thank you for talking to me today and sharing your great stories. Um, I'd like to have you back so we can pull out a few more because it sounds like you skipped over some parts and I go, oh, that sounds like it'd be something in there. Um, You're somebody that I've admired for a long time. Um, And and I want to tell people who are listening or watching that I I remember reaching out to you uh, for career advice about 10 years ago. Uh, because I'd seen the things that you'd done and I was going like, how can I, you know, that's kind of the life I'd like to have. Um, and, and you helped me out. And um, so I, it's, it's like talking to somebody I admired for a long time. So thank you very much. I I have to say the same to you. Um, we, we have these things we depend on. The Plum community depends on the software. They depend on the organization. But a talk I used to give, Plum is democracy. Uh, the community is more important than the software. And you have been, gosh, one of the 10 people that has kept, it's not the fun things all the time either, has kept things going, kept the conferences going, the gatherings, everything. Um, it's admirable for me to see someone like you who has just been at it for as long as you have. And uh, things that endure are things that I admire. So kudos to you. Kudos to you is kind of an avatar for all of the people like you that are doing this, the Plum Foundation board, the release managers. Um, it's the we that interests me. Uh, the all of us together, going back to Joel Burton, um, all of us together have made something independent of each one of us. It's, you know, it's outlasted Alan and Alex to a degree. We should all be proud of ourselves. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Take care. <laughs>